the main source of inspiration for the first book was the blackout of 2003. I was in my home community at the time, and although my brothers and I were freaked out, we were house sitting for our, our dad and stepmom who were away on summer holidays. Although we were pretty scared initially, we eventually had the revelation that we were in the best possible place for this to happen. We were in our home community where there were resourceful people around us who didn't need electricity because a lot of our, our elders, uh, a lot of our family members had grown up without it, including us. I'm Nathan Maharaj, and this is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is Wadgisha Grice, author of the 2018 novel, Moon of the Crusted Snow the story of an Anishinaabe community slowly realizing that what at first appeared to be a power outage might be the end of the world as we know it. His new novel, Moon of the Turning Leaves, finds the community realizing their time in this place may need to end, so they send out a band of walkers to find a new home. Wabgisha well, Grice, welcome to Kobo. Hi Nathan, thanks for having me. Oh, glad to have you here. I want to start with place. Place is so important to this book, mm -hmm. to both of these books. Um, it's vital to the story of this community. Can you give us a sense of where these characters are? Where, where in the world are they? What's life like for people living there or somewhere like there right now? So these characters would be in far northern Ontario. Uh, so for people looking at a map, I would say... Imagine somewhere, you know, a couple hundred to 300 kilometers north of the city of Timmins in sort of the James Bay lowlands. And I was purposefully uh, nondescript about precisely where for several reasons. You know, I didn't want to attach anything specific to a real community or, or real people who happen to inhabit certain parts of that area. But the history of this fictional community is one of displacement. They're originally from the north shore of Lake Huron, uh, sort of where I grew up. And through colonialism, they've been forced to go several hundred kilometers to the north and uh, have uh, a new beginning there uh, against you know, their own wishes, right? Which has happened throughout this continent and around the world to indigenous people, you know? So um, they're in this new landscape. Um, they're able to adapt to it or have been over several decades. Um, and once this cataclysm, this mysterious cataclysm uh, arises, uh, they have an opportunity to renew themselves, really, and, and you know, reestablish their connection with this land, which they've come to know. And that's sort of what the first story is, is essentially about. And then the second story finds them wanting to explore more widely uh, in the wake of all these successive traumas that they've endured, you know, history being one of them, and then this world ending blackout being yet another. And they go on this quest uh, south to see if, in fact, uh, the rest of the world uh, has ended uh, and also to reconnect with their original homeland. And this journey really is one of uh, revitalization for them and reconnection with the land and really uh, one of liberation because they're freely able to uh, seek out this land now um, without the sort of oppressive regime that they've come to operate under being you know Canada colonialism yeah. etc right there there are no crown lands when there is no crown exactly yeah <laughs> that's a great way to put it I'm, I'm gonna steal that off <laughs> it's all yours okay, it's all yours no footnotes required <laughs> You grew up, uh, I believe, in Wasoxing First Nation. Yes. Is is this the kind of thing maybe you'd think about as a kid? I mean, I was the kind of kid who would think all the time about like waking up from a nap and wondering, is the world still out there? Yeah. Would you like fantasize about like what if the world ended? What would we do here? What would I do? Where would I hide? Yeah, that's a really cool way to look at the world and really, I think, engage with it. When I was a kid. Uh, I grew up on the reserve uh, in, in a house that had no running water, no hydro, uh, very much bush living, right? Mm -hmm. And I was really, I think, engaged in that sort of gathering practice of getting food from the bush and, and hauling wood because we had a fire, uh, a wood stove and so on. Um, so it was, it was pretty much an isolated existence, even though uh, we could see the town of Perry Sound across the water. But that was really a different world in many ways, even though I'm also descended from Canadians. My mom is of European descent, but the, my parents raised us on the reserve. And, and, you know, when you have that 
um, like there, there's literally a, a barrier of water. And historically, my ancestors who live in Wasaksing um, were uh, not allowed to leave the community due to the Indian Act pass system, mm -hmm. right? So, so there is a, an actual divide, or there has been historically, you know? So that's like a separation of worlds to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when I was a kid, I would imagine my place in various realms, you know? Um, and, and really, I knew about our existence as outsiders, essentially, in our homelands. So, yeah, there, there was, you know, some imagination about what, you know, freedom essentially would look like, you know, if, if we were able to return, you know, to our old ways and so on. Uh, but, yeah, um, you know, where I am or where I've grown up is really not isolated at all. You know, like now it's about a two hour drive north of Toronto, you know, thanks to an mm. expanded highway and so on. Uh, whereas the community in the books uh, is much farther north, you know, um, initially uh, air access only or ice road access only. But that sort of changes throughout the course of the first book. Uh, so, yeah, I think thinking of place is really crucial when exploring a world like this and a story like this, because what I wanted to do was highlight the land itself. Um, not just as a setting, but potentially as a character, as something mm. with influence on these characters' lives and on the plot and so on. So, yeah, you know, I, I had a, a pretty, I think, interesting perspective of the world around me from a pretty early age, for sure. Mm. Moon of the Turning Leaves comes to us five years after Moon of the Crusted Snow. Why set the story, though, 12 years after Moon of the Crusted Snow? What What made that interval feel right? That's a great question. You know, I, I think when the idea of a sequel came up, it was, do I just pick it up right after the end of Moon of the Crested Snow? So the epilogue in Moon of the Crested Snow is two years after the end of, of like the last events, right? So they decide to move off into the bush. They've created a new settlement out there. Uh, so I thought, you know, do I just pick it up right from there, you know, in, in that immediate aftermath? And the more I thought about it, the more interested I was in placing it a little farther into the future because it was an opportunity to speculate a little mm. more about what their future could hold. And also, it helps the story itself stand alone in some ways, mm. right? Because the characters have developed in different ways. Um, the children in the first book are teens in the second book and, and they're protagonists in their own right in mm. the second book, right? Uh, so it was a way to, to sort of um, not just uh, provide like this buffer of time, but to think about how their values, uh, their objectives, um, their own sense of survival would have evolved uh, in the wake of this cataclysm, but also as their isolation has dragged on mm -hmm. over uh, you know, an extended period of time. So there are a bunch of things to really, I think, mentally dig through in terms of what that would do to a person, uh, but also how that would enrich themselves as an Ishnabek, you know, more deeply connected to the land and their culture and so on. And then going on this quest, how those things would empower them to hopefully succeed exploring these mysteries to the south, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that, you know, all those things wrapped into that development was, I think, essential to placing it into the future and trying to advance the story in, in a different and interesting way. Mm. Maybe I'm bringing too much dad energy to it, but <laughs> I was, I was, uh, uh, for me, the stakes were set when I got a sense of that they were, you know, the, the sweat lodge used tarps. Mm -hmm. There are no, no new tarps available. Mm -hmm. they, like, they will, the, the tarps we have are the tarps we have. Yeah. And 12 years, I'm thinking of, you know, my, my family goes camping a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking how long a tarp lasts us. 12 years, uh, you start to, you, you, like, you'd be babying those grommets. You'd yeah. be like really worrying about, you know, where, you know, uh, where, where is happening. Things are starting to leak. Um, thinking of the fishing line of the nets. Yeah. 12 years was a really interesting interval because it's, it's short enough that like all of that stuff is going to still be around. You'll probably still be able to scavenge it, but you're going to start to get a sense of how finite the supply yeah. is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, I considered my own home, my own supplies, my own skills, uh, considering 12 years into the future, what could happen after, you know, a world ending event. And yeah, you, you really get the sense of how durable 
uh, material things are around you. Mm. And yeah, it took a bit of research just to understand, you know, what would still last, you know, would cotton clothing still be intact, mm. you know, predominantly probably be nylon or polyester clothing still, you know, out there and so on. Um, synthetic tarps, you know, whether they're made of canvas or plastic, which would last longer, you know, see, these are, these are like the nerdy specific things that I had to look up to, yeah. to try to make it as believable as possible. Uh, but yeah, that that's part of what spurs them south too is you know their their nets falling apart, you know the running out of shoes maybe, um, and and you know other supplies are dwindling. Uh, but most importantly, like the food supply, the natural food supply around them is is drying up as well. So mm -hmm. they understand that traditionally their people were migratory and would have gone from place to place, and and part of this quest is them trying to rekindle that as well. Mm -hmm. The naming of Evan and Nicole's granddaughter, Wabascone, a uh, child to their son, Maingan. It's a quiet, intimate scene that happens early in the book. And as I read it, I thought, there's nothing like this in the first book. Mm. This isn't going to feel like a Stephen King novel the way the first book did. Um, <laughs> so, so I kind of, it was in that scene that I kind of laid aside a bunch of expectations I had come to, uh, that I'd come with. I was thinking I was going to get a thriller, but, but this is going to be something else. And so at that point, that was where I kind of let the story drive. But how did you conceive of the tone of, of the second book? Yeah, that was the, one of the bigger challenges too. You know, um, the first book is, is quite compact when you look at it, you know, it's 220 or so pages. Um, it, it moves at, a pretty quick pace all things considered right mm. due to the great editing that uh, i had from susan renouf at, at ecw press so there was a way that i learned how to uh, turn what could be potentially a boring situation which is a power outage in a northern community with nothing to do mm. you know doesn't sound that exciting to begin with right um so you know she really helped me um condense things and make them move in a better way so I thought, okay, for the second story, you know, I have a bit more time creatively to put a little more thought into it because I had left my job at CBC by then. And this was essentially my full-time work for a couple of years. So I wanted to touch on all these themes and, and really put them into this quest, right? And then when you also think about the overall premise of walking through the bush for a month and a half, couple months, Sounds kind of boring too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there were things to to sort of inject along the way to to make it a little more interesting. And and in that sense, like it, it's sort of the thriller aspect is is I wouldn't necessarily say softened, but it's mm. sort of stretched a little bit. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the original scene, uh, the initial birth in Moon of the Turning Leaves. Um, I, I really wanted to start it that way because, you know, in the first book, there's just so much death, you know, and there is really, uh, an overhaul of a way of life. And I wanted to show the potential for a new beginning in the second one, but also the celebratory process of a birth and having a traditional practice of bringing a baby into the world in ceremony in mm. the bush and then naming her right away mm -hmm. uh, in, in that custom, I think was a, a statement I wanted to make, not just about the story and these characters um, and the subsequent tone of this novel, but also what Indigenous people more broadly are able to celebrate because you know our customs have not been totally obliterated, even though that was the intention mm -hmm. of the state's under which we operate, right? Uh, and also, you know, I had two kids born during the course of uh, creating this book. And um, those were obviously very profound uh, life moments for me um, that are some of the most important. And, and I really wanted to sort of harness that joy I felt in those moments and, and put them into the book, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, there's a beautiful line. Uh, the routine of taking care of this fresh existence was a balm, and I thought that was that was that that's one of those those things that only someone who's who's been who's been tasked and and fully immersed in caring for a newborn would would. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of an existential statement of like 
It's your whole focus. Yeah. And it is calming in a way because nothing else matters. It's, no. This is what we're doing. Yeah. And, and, and another part of that, too, is, uh, you know, in so many indigenous communities, uh, women have to leave to give birth, right? Mm. Um, I was born in Toronto because it was considered a high-risk pregnancy for my mother. Mm. Uh, so, so many births happen outside of our communities and, and off of the land and so on. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother actually talked to me about this one several years ago. She said, you know, I, I believe that we'll be able to really be strong again when we can give birth to our babies at home in our communities once again. Because mm -hmm. births aren't happening on the land in that communal sense. It was a pretty beautiful eye-opening thing for her to impart upon me. And uh, yeah, so that's a part of it too, is to pay homage to uh, the women who are really working hard to make sure that happens mm. in communities. You spoke about kind of stretching the, the um, genre uh, of the thriller mm -hmm. to bend it a little bit. Um, and, and I certainly got that sense of that from the outset, you weren't going to start with ratcheting tension up uh, the way a thriller must, the way, the way a 220 page thriller mm -hmm. absolutely has to. Mm -hmm. um, but instead I got a sense that as a reader, I was being brought into the community and, and it happened in a really interesting way. There's a scene where Nangon's daughter of Nicole and Evan, um, she expresses some frustration. Um, nobody's telling her exactly what happened way back then. It's, mm -hmm. it's this thing nobody speaks of. Um, but I know, I read, I read the book. I was, I was there. Every reader knows, presumably every reader reading this monologue by her, this, this angry speech, uh, to her elders. Um, we're, I, I, I felt like I was standing there and Nengons was kind of yelling at me and I was just kind of scratching <laughs> the side of my head and like side-eyeing to Evan. I'm like, dude, we got to settle this. We can't carry on like this. Uh, um, again, bringing big dad energy to yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Were you thinking of the reader in that scene at all that 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 we would that there was going to be that distance between us and and this central character? Yeah, and and I really have to give credit to my editor Rick Meyer for for helping me really establish Nangos's voice. My original plan, and this is what happened in the first draft, was to have sort of Evan be the central storyteller or the central perspective, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then halfway through, Nango sort of takes charge. You know, mm -hmm. that speech being one of the catalysts for her um, emerging as a leader, right? But Rick said, you know, if you introduce her perspective and her view of the world earlier on, that's really going to help with the world building. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, I think, help illustrate just what kind of new era this is for somebody like her. You know, she barely has any memory of the time before. And and all she knows really is this, you know, hunting and sort of gathering lifestyle that she's really skilled at and that she's passionate about. And providing for her community is something that she really takes pride in. But she's dealing with traumatized adults and elders who aren't really sure how to talk to her and the younger generation about what happened to them, mm. um, mostly due to the ongoing traumas that they have already endured as, as Indigenous people, you know? Mm -hmm. So she's able to see the world through much fresher eyes. Um, the adults who came before her absorbed a lot of the trauma for her, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I've seen that healing process within my own family and within my own, own community, how adults ensured that people like me growing up in the 80s and 90s um, didn't have to endure the same hardships that they did. You know, mm -hmm. they worked hard to let us heal. And, and that's not to say that they shielded us from the past or, or kept details from us, but that's sort of how it works in this story. And, and that's why there's that bit of um, gap in, in awareness for her. And eventually, you know, a kid's going to grow up mm -hmm. and they're going to develop their own psyche mm -hmm. and they're going to see the world through more mature eyes and they're going to want to know. And, and that's what we're seeing Nangos do uh, throughout the story. But then she's more um, prone to, I think, the courage that's required to move through this um, mysterious landscape and era and, and hopefully lead the, lead the way into a new future for mm. her people. It's, it's also, it occurs to me as you, as, you, as you speak about it now, that Evan and Nicole, uh, Evan White Sky, he would be of a generation that would have had modeled for them Trauma happens and we either don't talk about it or we won't be together to share this. We won't have that opportunity for, for, for the younger generation to yell at the older generation and say, God damn it, what the hell happened? Yeah. Right? And it was kind of beautiful that, that 
that Nengos was there to be able to do that, that the community yeah. was there, that she could express that frustration and that there could be some working through, that the opportunity was even was even there. Yeah. So so we're talking a lot about Nengos and she's a really important character being raised mostly after after this cataclysm. She turns out to be a gifted hunter. Mm -hmm. She's a major provider of the community. When did it click for you, though, that she would emerge as as this central figure? I think early on, when I made the decision to place it uh, farther into the future, you know, 10 years after the end of, after their move into the bush, uh, I had to think about who would be at the center of the future. And of course, it would be the younger generation, right? And... I think it was the choice between her and her brother, Mayangan. Um, and just with her, uh, you know, she's there in the first book, but more or less in the background with her brother, right? And I thought about how could I make her, you know, heroic? You know, how could I make her emerge? You know, hopefully maybe be a role model for other young Indigenous people who read this, who read this book, you know? Mm. Um, and Mayangan becomes a father early in the story, so he's unable to take part in this quest, right? Uh, so then it's up to her to really uh, carry the torch, so to speak, into the future for her family, her community, and, and her nation more widely, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, like, I, I don't remember the exact moment I, I made that decision. I think it, it just emerged kind of or organically when I thought about this family again and who I wanted to represent them. And, and it was largely her, for mm -hmm. sure, with, with, of course, Evan being by her side, you know, still being the central figure uh, because he, you know, helped catalyze this movement, movement into the bush for them, too. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, and, and just all these thing, all these characters still in play in my head. Uh, and, and I think the affection I have for them maybe allowed that to happen in, in a natural way. Uh, mm -hmm. But that that's a really good question and I can't pinpoint it, but it just, it seemed natural to me. It seemed like it made the most sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, shout out Mein Gan for, for, for taking proper parental leave. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Baby born, he steps aside. Yeah. He's like, my sister's going to have to carry the plot. Got yeah. a baby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a scene uh, where she really, she's making her case for like why if it's important for us to to scout, if we got to be out there, we're going to be living on the land. I should be mem a member of this party, perilous or not. I'm our best hunter, so I should be out there. Mm -hmm. um, and she really, <laughs> she really rubs Evan's face in the fact that her skills, the boldness of her making this demand, it's all she was raised to be. Yeah, yeah. She's just she's she's pitching this like it's like you're a great parent. You raised a strong daughter. Check it out. Here it comes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Was that coming from you thinking of being a child or was that, was that like a parent, parental kind of wish or projection? I think, yeah, it was probably a parental wish or a projection. You know, when I was a kid, I was, I was hugely supported by my parents, uh, by my aunts, uncles, grandparents, wider family. Um, I had aspirations to, you know, see the world and they never uh, held me back or, you know, had different sort of plans for me. They, they said, you know, just, just let her rip, go do what you need to, you know. And that mm. included going on a student exchange when I was just 17 years old to, to Germany for a year, mm. right? So, so I grew up pretty quickly in that sense. Um, but yeah, my parents never resisted anything. And, you know, they were very, uh, I just had a wonderful upbringing thanks to them. So yeah, I think that comes from me putting myself in a parental situation where would I let my teenage daughter, you know, go out and save the world essentially, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, you know, I have, I have three boys, they're all still pretty young. Uh, the eldest is just uh, uh, coming up on seven uh, later this fall. Um, and and I, ca I cannot imagine that, you know, mm. if he came to me and said, and, you know, it was the end. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy, you know, whether you like it or not, because you empowered me to do so. Um, it would be really hard to dispute that because that's the kind of person I want him to be, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's sort of where that sort of mild fit family tension comes from, I think. And, yeah, it's, it's entirely my projections as a father, for sure. Yeah. You, you have written, you said... Um, any indigenous literature, whether fiction or nonfiction, is post-apocalyptic. And you, you've, I think you alluded to that earlier, even in this conversation. The meaning of that's fairly clear to anybody with even a cursory understanding of history. But what I want to ask you is, how does that concept situate you 
to write a post-apocalyptic book or, or series of books in a way that maybe you haven't read before or seen done before? Mm. It's a great question. And, you know, uh, I think that's that's widely accepted. I can't remember who originally said that mm. statement about all literature being uh, post-apocalyptic coming from an Indigenous perspective. But, you know, Cherie Demoline has said it. Mm. Uh, and, of course, she's, you know, changed the world with, with the Marrow Thieves in, in, in her work, right? Yeah. Um, and, and where that really comes from is, is understanding that perspective. Uh, so I, I talk often about the main source of inspiration for the first book was the blackout of 2003. Uh, I was in my home community at the time, and although my brothers and I were freaked out, we were house sitting for our, our dad and stepmom who were away on summer holidays. Um, although we were pretty scared initially, we eventually, I think, had the revelation that we were in the best possible place for this to happen. We were in our home community where there were resourceful people around us who didn't need electricity, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of our, our elders, uh, a lot of our family members had grown up without it, including us. Like we didn't grow up with, with hydroelectricity either. Um, so, so that, you know, was really cool to see that, you know, th this is a land-based way of living that really supersedes any technological luxury, you know? And then about a year or so after that, I was talking to my grandmother. I was back home in Wasoxing visiting. And there was all this like anniversary coverage of the blackout in the news. So we were talking about it. And, and I said, you know, grandma, like, I thought that was the end of the world. And she just kind of scoffed. And she's like, ah, end of the world. You know, that's, 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 we've gone through that so many times, right? And then she reminded me that it was her grandparents' generation that were originally displaced from the mainland the North Shore of Lake Huron, out to the island where our reserve is now. Mm. And she explained to me just how, how devastated they were. She told me the story she heard as a little girl from these elders about not being able to return to their homelands. And then, you know, forestry became the primary industry in Perry Sound, and they saw all the trees from their original home be cut down, mm. which was just hugely traumatic for them. And she said that was the end of the world for, for our family. And that's only a few generations removed from you, right? Mm. Uh, so she also then reminded me that, like, take a look at the things we still have, you know, Lang our language is in rough shape, but we still have it. You know, a lot of the ceremonies came back to our community in the last 20 years. You know, we have people learning how to drum and, and dance at the powwow and things like that. And uh, people are going out into the bush again to learn things. You know, you kids are learning stuff in the bush, which is great. And, and she said, these are all the things that are still around that weren't supposed to be because our homeland was stolen from us and our identities were destroyed and, and stolen from us as well, you know? So that perspective of already having survived apocalypse was, was crucial for me in, in developing the first book. And I think that spirit really carried into the second book too. But getting back to that, that general statement about uh, indigenous literature all being post-apocalyptic or dystopian. Um, a lot of indigenous literature really is about that reclamation of self, about that exposure of the harms of the settler colonial system, and the path forward that a lot of us are trying to find, you know, to restore who we are as indigenous people. And all these great pieces of literature happen in different circumstances, different characters, uh, different settings showing that way forward. And it's not to say, you know, Indigenous literature is entirely trauma-based or about recovering from tragedy, but that is part of the Indigenous story living in this post-apocalyptic era, which it in fact is, you know, mm. I think objectively that's the truth, you know. So uh, th I think that's where that comes from. And in, in, in that sense, like it, I feel empowered to look beyond the general tropes of post-apocalyptic fiction, of it all being death, destruction, despair, and ending in those realms of death, destruction, and despair. Uh, because so many books in the so-called canon are contained in that just doom and gloom, right? Mm. Uh, so there is, when you have a lived experience, a lived history of doom and gloom, and you've been empowered to come out the other side because of the healing that's happened in your family, and your community, you have a different sort of perspective of what that can be. And, and really, hopefully, it empowers other people to think about their future in another way, too. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you went there, because that's actually where my next question is, is going, is that what this community knows about surviving on the land, uh, harvesting wild rice is, a, is an early example of, of something that 
I don't think they would have figured out on their own. I really think it, it took an elder to read mm. to read the land um, and and be able to actually like you know get nutrition from it. Mm. Um, fishing, all of that stuff is is passed down, and it only had that chance to be passed down uh, because of this cataclysm. Mm-hmm. Um, had had it not forced people to figure out how to live on the land, uh, these elders may have just gone and taken that knowledge to the grave. Mm. Which puts this book in a, in a curious place, which which you you've you, you've been speaking about is that it's a post apocalyptic novel where growth and fulfillment is part of it. When the world ends, we have to question like what was the world? I think it's also the kind of concept that maybe maybe it would have been tough for a reading audience to grasp ten years ago. Yeah, but we all just went through a, a pandemic together. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're still you know climbing out of it i feel like it's a reading a a reading audience couldn't be better primed to concede the point that like some parts of the world we all felt a sense of like i hope that doesn't come back and i mean (laughs) capitalism does as capitalism does and a lot of it did come back (laughs) yeah yeah. but we had a time where we got to see that yeah was that sort of covid era sense of of opportunity of return um was that something that was on your mind as as thinking like you know this was the story to tell now a little bit, yeah. Mm. Uh, you you mentioned like like the 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 hopes or or the the imagination of a future in in the aftermath, right? Uh, the Cherokee scholar and author Daniel Heath Justice has a really cool term for indigenous speculative fiction. He he calls it wonder works. Mm. He prefers to refer it that way because it's about wondering about the future after the collapse of the state and what you can bring from the past into that new future. Totally inspired and informed by your traditions and, and language and ceremonies and so on, right? So speaking more widely, you know, that was, I think, my hope for the early days of the pandemic, too, for everybody, you know, not just Indigenous people. Mm. I was inspired by some of the wider discussions around small-scale agriculture, community gardens, mm-hmm. because the trucks and the trains couldn't bring uh, food into the supermarkets in towns and cities everywhere, mm-hmm. right? So there is this new perspective on coming together as a community. And, and that really harkens back to the agrarian backgrounds of pretty much everybody around the world. You know, every civilization, every community has this knowledge or has this foundation of getting food from the land. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where, what, where we're all from. And only in the past 200, 300 years or so in the area of industrialization have we become reliant upon, you know, these wider uh, mass produced uh, supplies and distribution and so on. Right. So I saw those things happening and they gave me hope in the early months because that was a really hard time. I think everybody would agree, you know, those, you know, the spring and summer of 2020 um, was kind of scary because, you know, there was no definitive vaccine out yet um we're all locked down we're supposed to like keep our uh, social distance or physical distance in this in the grocery store and so on um and and yeah those those uh, i think discussions around organizing and community were were really great uh and and then in the writing the book you know that sort of inspired you know this this small community still maintaining their spirit of togetherness and and their desire to work together to survive right uh one thing that did change was uh, my editor rick and i were talking about you know the plot and you know various elements of it and so on and and in this book it's revealed what caused the blackout Mm -hmm. and sort of some of the things that that happened in the aftermath that caused this wider collapse right Mm -hmm. and we originally talked about a plague being part of that (laughs) Uh, but like in the thick of the pandemic, we sort of, you know, lessened that element because we were worried that, you know, at the end of this all, when the uh, when the book is out, people might not want to explore that anymore. So I think that probably helped really um, refine those community elements of the plot and, and that sort of family uh, motivation to move forward and, and stay together and so on. But uh, yeah, the the pandemic obviously was a huge influence on on the creation of this book for sure mm. were there books that you were thinking of that you wanted to evoke pay homage to or even um contrast against mm-hmm. 
that that's a great question you know like i uh you know i picked a stack of books when i was doing the research and development uh to read um one of them was Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Mm -hmm. And I think the main reason for that was she places a lot of that story 20 years after the end of the plague in that book. And, and I was doing a similar jump into the future, right? Mm. So I wanted to see how she did that. And I was really inspired by um, how she painted the world uh, in a really unique way. Like that book obviously is is a global phenomenon for for good reason, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the first book, you know, in a lot of ways was inspired by The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Um, but I wanted to push back against some of the things in that because in, in that story, there aren't many discussions about finding other people or creating community. It's mm -hmm. just straight up survival. Yep. You know, this father and the son escaping cannibals, essentially. Right. <laughs> Uh, so that's what, in the first book, that's what I wanted to sort of capture. Uh, and, and I went back to McCarthy uh, for Blood Meridian because I remembered, like, the way he writes the land in that story um, really gives the land agency in some way, too. You know, the land is something that these characters have to contend with and, and essentially respect for their survival because a lot of these characters, as depraved as they are in Blood Meridian, they're navigating a new landscape too. Mm. They're, they're moving through it and, and figuring out how to survive among, uh, within it, right? And, and I, I wanted to draw just upon those elements of it. And I, I see Blood Meridian as a post-apocalyptic story too. It's about the end of the world for the indigenous people mm. in, in the Southwest United States. You know, you have these uh, bounty hunters out to massacre them, you know? Uh, so as an indigenous person, it's, it's, it's a trip to read that book, but at the same time, it provides that perspective of, of a world ending too. Uh, so yeah, you know, those are the two books that immediately come to mind, uh, Blood Meridian and, and, uh, Station Eleven. But, uh, yeah, you know, like, I think it's essential to read other literature when you want to create a certain story on your own for inspiration, to help answer your own questions you have, mm -hmm. to really just, you know, absorb as much as you can about that kind of storytelling. You know, I think it's, it's crucial. Mm. How hard was it to write these characters with different levels of bilingual fluency? Mm. Was it something you did in the moment? Was it something you sort of like had to come back to and massage into shape? I think it, it was really looking at, you know, myself and people in my circle and the level of comprehension amongst everybody in terms of Anishinaabe M1, you know, like uh, I have the capabilities maybe of, of a toddler in terms of uh, speaking, um, but I understand, you know, to a much greater degree uh, the language when, when I read it and when I hear it and so on, mm -hmm. right? Um, but people around me are, you know, on different parts of that journey. Like one of my brothers, uh, he's pretty much fluent now. He's taking it upon himself to 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 learn, and that's his main line of work now, right? Is is language restoration? Wow, uh, which is wonderful. Yeah, he and his peers do do excellent work at the grassroots for that. Uh, so yeah, I really wanted to show just how it's a journey for so many people, and when. I didn't want to misrepresent my own skills in the story. So what you see in the story is is basically the extent of what I can do with mm. Anishinaab M1. So like some conversational passages, um, a bit of like the uh, nuance of, of slang in some ways within the language. Like I'm, I'm capable of that. But again, I'm surrounded by really resourceful people. So uh, Dr. Marianne Corbier, who is originally from uh, Wequemkong, uh, on Manitoulin Island, uh, she was one of my, re she is one of my recent teachers. And, uh, you know, I was able to consult with her to make sure I had some of those uh, passages um, accurately represented. Mm. Uh, but the main reason is just to have the language in the book, you know, mm. having a novel, which is an English text, uh, with bits of language, you know, peppered throughout, I think is, is really important for me to convey just because I want to show that the language is still out there and it's still being spoken by a lot of people. And at the end of the world, hopefully it would get this boost to recover, you know, and, and you see efforts uh, among some of the characters in this story to do that. Mm. We don't, we don't know, as you said, we don't know what the cataclysm was after Moon of the Crusted Snow. We just know something bad happened and there's no electricity. Moon of the Turning Leaves, as you said, gives us some, some idea from the testimony of characters. They saw some stuff in the sky. Mm -hmm. We have some idea that it's electromagnetic pulse, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> like, 
probably that that's our best our best hypothesis now, but uh, uh, we, we've got a little bit more. Now, you mentioned in the acknowledgments of Moon of the Turning Leaves uh, that you had a significant meeting in, in, I think, 2019 with some of the folks at Penguin Random House Canada who published this, this newest book. I have to ask if the significance of that meeting was partly that there's going to be more than just one. Is there a, is there a third book on the way? <laughs> well, initially, I, I ruled out a second book back when the first one came out. Yeah. Uh, because I honestly had not thought about what a sequel could be, you mm. know? And uh, with the cause in particular, I was like, well, I never have to tell anybody what I thought it was because, you know, that's part of the mystery. That's part mm -hmm. of the, the intrigue of the story. Uh, so, you know, when, when I got this story in development, uh, I thought, okay, I have to, I have to give people more. There's no way they're going to read a whole other novel and not get any answers and, and be satisfied, right? Mm. If they don't learn, they're going to be pretty uh, mad about, <laughs> about having spent all this time reading this story. But, uh, to answer your question, you know, um, I, I'm not working on it right now, but I'm not ruling it out. Um, I do have a vague idea for something that I may want to do for a part three, but I don't want to vocalize it yet because it, it just might not work, right? Okay. But, um, and, and also there are some other stories I want to try to write first before I get back into this world because like spending almost a decade, you know, writing about the end of the world can, can get kind of heavy, right? So I want to write something a little, a little more lighthearted next. Yeah, no doubt. Especially when, uh, a, an actual pandemic yeah. shows up, like after the, yeah. the, after you did it the first time, it's, it's a bit much. Yeah. Uh, well, I know better than to press an author about, uh, about tentative ideas. So this is me retreating now. <laughs> I, I understand via CBC first words that the first Anishinaabe Moan word you heard was ani, which I think means like, hi, it's like yeah. an informal hi. Mm -hmm. um, first word I heard probably wouldn't surprise you to be miigwech. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, I guess, how I close is uh, miigwech. Well, oh, miigwech, Nathan. This is a, has been a really enjoyable conversation. I have been speaking with Wabgeshik Rice, author of the new novel, Moon of the Turning Leaves, Find it and all the books we spoke about at Kobo and Conversations home on the web, kobo.com slash conversation. Check the show notes for a link. Subscribe to your podcast player to catch every episode. And if you enjoyed this one, send it to someone, anyone. Send it to them immediately because there is no telling when the telecommunications infrastructure will collapse and kick off an apocalypse for which I am ill-prepared, just to speak for myself. Kobo and Conversation is produced and often hosted by me, Nathan Maharaj. Thank you for listening. 